Welcome. Good to see you tonight. It's time for our question and answer portion. And by the way, I just want to mention briefly, sometimes people win that Strong's Concordance and they don't know the treasure that they have. Um, if you don't know how those things work, you know, if you, like when you were a kid and you learned a lot of Bible verses and you get to an adult, you're trying to remember, or even you learn them as an adult and you can't remember the verse, if you can remember one word out of that verse... You can take the Strong's exhaustive concordance and you look that one word up alphabetically and you, you can, it'll show a portion of each of the verses that that word is used in and then you can f find that verse you're trying to think of. But even furthermore, you, if you can be a Hebrew and a Greek scholar without having taken any Hebrew or Greek because in the Strong's exhaustive concordance it lists every word every time it's listed in the Bible and it has a number beside that. It's either a H or a G going to the Hebrew a dictionary in the back or the Greek dictionary in the back. And you can find the Hebrew transliteration of the word. You can see how it's written in the original Greek, the original Hebrew. And then you can find the English transliteration, the definition. And so it's just a really be a wonderful study tool. So anyway, congratulations to those who've been winning those. Okay, first question tonight. Why was the devil given such a long time to see, to see his fate, and yet others were put to death and were no more? And then the other question on the card says, Catholics baptize children that have no choice. Okay. Uh, the first question is going to be addressed in the subject tonight, so you'll get your answer as we go along. The second one, you know, I didn't address a couple of things last Saturday night when we talked about baptism, you know. Um, I mentioned that the only biblical method is immersion, and we saw that very clearly from the scriptures, but so the, the point is this, a person that has to make a conscious decision to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior, you have to be at a point mentally where you can make that decision for yourself. That's when it becomes appropriate for baptism. Uh, so a child who's an infant, they are not making any conscious choice to uh, accept Christ to, to, in place of their sins and all that. So, um, so the, the kids that are baptized or sprinkled, you know, really I feel like, and I think the Bible teaches that if you, if you were um, uh, sprinkled at some point as an adult, you need to make that choice to be baptized the biblical way. Okay, last question. How will the people that lived before Christ, before Christ was born, baptized and crucified, be judged? Will they have a chance to make it to heaven or hell? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Uh, go to Romans chapter 2, if you would, would. Let me find it, and I'll tell you what page it's on. Romans chapter 2. In the seminar Bibles, it is page 1118, 1118, verse 13 and 14. What about people who never heard of Jesus? The question, I guess, is answer is asked. What happens to the, if you never heard of Jesus, you live for perhaps on some remote location that the gospel never reached? What happens? How are you judged? Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 13. I'm just going to sum it up. Uh, verse 12. Let's go to, uh, well, verse 11. I keep seeing more and more we were to add. Romans uh, 2, verse 11 and following. For there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. And listen to verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Verse 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. Sounds confusing. Next verse. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, and their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Whew. It's a mouthful. What that says, as I understand it, is that those who have never heard of Jesus, we're going to look at another text in just a moment, but those who have never heard of Jesus, you know, God's Spirit is, is, is working in this world on everyone's heart. God's Holy Spirit is, is, is seeking to save everyone. And so they'll, they'll obviously, they're people who have never heard the gospel of Jesus preached, but the Holy Spirit has tried to speak to everyone's heart throughout time. And so what it says, when those who uh, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. In other words, they're judged in a different way. Even though they never heard of Jesus, they had the Spirit working on their hearts, and they had the opportunity to respond to that Spirit. 
And say, for instance, someone in a faraway country or a land that never heard Jesus, and they were mean and wicked, and, and, but the Spirit was speaking to their hearts. And they begin to respond to that spirit. They begin to be kind and gentle and loving or whatever. That's the, the evidence of God's spirit working on your heart. No, they may not have heard of Jesus died for, your, for my sins. But it says they're a law unto themselves. Quickly, Zechariah chapter 13, verse uh, 6. Zechariah 13, right there at the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah, I'll tell you what page number it's on. 13, verse 6. Interesting text. Page 939. Page 939. This is uh, speaking prophetically there of Jesus, and apparently in heaven. And it says, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. And the point I think for me in this text is this, is that there may be people in heaven that say, You know, Jesus, they see, meet Jesus, they see the, the scars in his hands and, and his side, and think, how, how did you get those? Because they never heard of Jesus. And he'll tell them. And so, again, I believe that people are judged by what they know, and God won't hold it against you if you've never heard something. But anyway, God's merciful. He's good, right? Tonight, this subject we're going to look at here, beginning in just a moment, is, is uh, one for me that can change the whole, your whole view of God. It can help you. I mean, when you leave tonight, I hope you love God more than you've ever loved Him before. You appreciate His character more than you ever appreciated it before. And so we're going to look at Revelation's hellfire and the end of sin. We're going to see where hell is located. We're going to see how many people are in there right now. Um, and again, this is one of those subjects that I think Satan has twisted. It's taken and twisted in such a way, and, and it's warped our whole sense of, the, of God's nature and God's character. And we're going to unpack it as we go tonight. But anyway, before we do, let's please pray together. Father, tonight again, we're praying for the Spirit of the living God to be among us. And uh, there's not a one of us worthy of that spirit tonight, and so we're coming before you in the name of Jesus, asking you to cleanse us of our sins and purify our hearts and, and send your Holy Spirit to speak to us tonight through your word, I pray in Christ's name, amen. You know this morning that people just like you got up in paradise, they took showers, they drove to work, and they ate breakfast, and did you know that there are people in hell that did the very same thing? I'm talking about Paradise, California, and Hell, Michigan. <clears throat> By the way, the population of Hell is 1,009. Interesting. 1,009, the population of Hell. We know it now. Uh, and yes, it did finally happen. Hell froze over. <clears throat> Tonight, I want to talk about the Hell that most of us have grown up hearing about and preached about and we grew up listening to and hearing sermons about that and it's where the bad people go when they die and it's the place where sinners burn in Hell eternally forever and ever and ever and it's for, by flames that never quite consume them, that never quite go out and the devil's there with a pitchfork presiding over the whole uh, wicked mess. There was an issue of the U.S. News and World Report, and it revealed some very interesting things on the topic of hell about some of the views of Americans. And uh, the article focused on what American people thought or speculated about the place that we call hell. And this poll taken by the U.S. News and World Report, they said this. They said that 64% of those polled believed that there was a hell, 25% that said they didn't believe in hell, and 9% said that they weren't quite sure, they didn't know. Hell is a subject that has received a lot of attention during the 19th and the first part of the 20th century. Preachers used to vie over who could preach the hottest hell. I mean, they would preach this, and I mean, you, if you've ever read through some of those sermons from those years, it's, it's interesting to hear. And they thought the hotter their hell they could preach, the more converts to Christ that they would have. And so this evening, what I want to do is preach the hottest hell you have ever heard preached in your life. It's coming tonight. The truth is that a lot of people are not wanting to go to heaven to be with Jesus as much as they want to escape going to hell and burning forever and ever, ever. It's called a fire escape religion. 
In the year 1741, in in Enfield, Massachusetts, you might have heard of the revivalist preacher, Jonathan Edwards. He preached a sermon that is now famous world round. You can go on the internet and look it up. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I want to quote a little bit of his description of God holding unrepentant sinners over the fires of hell. And this is what he said. The God that holds you over the pit of hell, excuse me, the God that holds you over the pit of hell, yeah, much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over a fire, abhors you, is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are 10,000 times more abominable in his eyes than the most hateful, venomous serpent is in ours. He goes on. This is God's view of people. He's holding in the fire. There will be no end to your exquisite, horrible misery. When you look forward, you shall see a long forever of boundless duration before you, which will swallow up your thoughts and amaze your soul. You will absolutely despair of ever having any deliverance, any end, any mitigation, any rest at all. It went on to quote the sermon to say this, The flames do now rage and glow. The glittering sword is wet and held over them, and the pit has opened her mouth under them. O sinner, consider the fearful danger you're in. The question I want us to think about is, does the the Bible teach there's a God that would burn people forever and ever and ever? I want to look at the truth about hell tonight. Does it teach that God is so angry with you or me or someone who's an unrepentant sinner, that he will burn them forever. His wrath will never, ever be satisfied. A lot of preachers around the world are still preaching the same sermon-type sermons that Jonathan Edwards preached. They want people to be afraid of God. They think that people will begin to live a righteous life because of their fear of God. When I was seven years old, I was attending a Southern Baptist church. The preacher preached a sermon on hellfire. Scared me half to death. Seven years old. I went home. I told my mom, I've got to be baptized. She talked to me. She said, son, I don't really, she didn't really think I was making a good decision at that point. She said, you need to talk to the preacher. So we went and talked to the preacher. And sure enough, I was scared to death and, and I would end up being baptized. But you know what? I was baptized because I didn't want to go to hell. It wasn't because I loved Jesus. It wasn't because I was surrendering my sin, of my, myself and my sins to Christ. It's because I was afraid of burning forever and ever and ever. And a lot of people have made decisions on that basis with no love of Christ whatsoever. There's a book I want to share. You might have heard of uh, Bertrand Russell. I'll tell you something about him in a minute. But first let me ask you this. How can we preach a God who is infinitely angry and, and vengeful, and yet preached he is the same God that is nothing but love. Does the Bible teach that God has some kind of split personality? He's loving part of this time, and then part of the time he's this raging tyrant whose, whose anger can never be satisfied. He tortures you or sinners all throughout eternity. Bertrand Russell. He was this famous philosopher who turned away from Christianity because of this teaching of hell. It's why he turned away. He wrote a book, uh, Why I'm Not a Christian. And in it, he said this. He says, There's one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character. And that is that he believed in hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. I must say that I think all this doctrine... Uh, that hellfire is a punishment for sin is a doctrine of cruelty. It's a doctrine that put cruelty into the world and gave the world generations of cruel torture. And the Christ of the Gospels, if you could take him as his chroniclers represent him, would certainly have to be considered partly responsible for that. I agree with what he says. Another revivalist preacher back from those years, Samuel Hopkins, he gave this description of God's ever-burning hell. He said, the smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever in the sight of the blessed before their eyes. This display of divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed and most entertaining and highest pleasure to those that love God. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would be in a great measure put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed. What? 
How can I find joy in the pain and suffering of anyone? See, the devil wants to paint a distorted picture of God. Remember he started back in heaven? Misaligning the character of God? We've been talking about that. Here he goes again. He, he wants to frame God for his own crimes. He wants to make it look as if, if God is a source of pain and suffering and death. And the devil wants people to fear God knowing that you can't love someone. You can't love someone that you, that you fear like that. You can't really do it. You, can't, uh, you don't fear someone that you love, right? A lot of preachers are confused on this subject, and they've got these important and unbiblical doctrine from Middle Ages. They've brought it into the Christian church. And you're thinking, uh-oh, where's he going tonight? You're going to see here in just a minute. You know, countless, probably thousands of people have turned from Jesus because of this doctrine. And, you know, I grew up in the Southern Baptist Church, so let me add this. <clears throat> I always was wondered about this, this whole teaching. But... The way I grew up and understand and still believe to, to, to a large degree is that God is God. He created me. He can do whatever he wants to do, right? I, I believe that. I agree with that. But as I've found over the years that God is so loving and kind and merciful, he is not going to go completely against his character and do something very different to that. Would a God who gave his only son to die on the cross, who God said, a God that said in 2 Peter 3, 9, he says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, would he burn sinners forever and ever and ever in the fires of hell because they choose to not accept his offer of salvation? A lot of sincere people have turned from Christianity because of this doctrine. You know, there are three things I want you to know as we begin to get into this from the Bible here in just a moment. One, I want you to first know that I do believe in hellfire. I believe in a hotter fire than most of you believe in, which you're going to see tonight. Uh, first, God's not a destroyer. Satan is. Secondly, um, God is not to blame for sin and suffering. Satan is. And third, God does not burn people in hell forever and ever and ever. You're going to see that tonight. It might come as a shock. First time I heard it, it kind of rattled my bones a little bit. We're going to see it from the Bible, though. Listen carefully and listen prayerfully before you reach a conclusion tonight. When we look at the Bible and we see, we're going to discover that, yeah, it talks about a, a literal burning hell, no question about it, but not the kind that's used to frighten Christians or cr fright, frighten people into serving God. Let's look at the word hell for just a moment, the word <clears throat> hell itself. Again, you can go to that Strong's Concordance that I was talking about earlier, and you'll find the word that's used for hell is listed in the Bible some 54 times. In the Old Testament, it's, it's only one word. It's the word sheol, which th it's used 31 times. In the New Testament, the word Hades is used 10 times. And both of those words, the word sheol and the word Hades, means the grave. It doesn't mean a place of burning, anything like that. Uh, in the New Testament, the word Gehenna is lit, used 12 times, and it means a place of burning. And by the way, Gehenna was a, 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 the, like the dump outside the city of Jerusalem where they would take all their refuse, the dead corpses of animals, uh, all their trash. They would take it out there. There was this place that was burning all the time outside the city of Jerusalem, and so it was the dump where everybody took all their stuff. So it was a place of burning. So when it says Gehenna, it's not talking about a place of burning somewhere in the middle of, of the earth or wherever that's burning forever and ever and ever. It was talking about a literal place, used 12 times. Uh, the New Testament, the word Tartarus is used one time. It means the dark abyss or the pit, like we looked at last night. So you can see the use of the word itself every time it's used there in the Scriptures. But let's see right now. Go to Matthew chapter 13, verse 37. Matthew 13, page 962. Matthew 13, 37. Let's see where hell will be, and we can count the population right now. From this one text, Matthew 13, 37, this is Jesus speaking, page 962, and he answered and said unto them, he that soweth the good seed is the son of man, verse 38, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one, so these are those lost people, 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is when? 
into the world, and the reapers are the angels. So notice now, verse 30, verse 40, Jesus is going to tell us uh, when, when it's going to be. Verse 40, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. Point is this, according to Jesus, this punishment of the wicked will come at the end of the world. That's when the tares or the wicked are burned. And so according to that, the population of hell right now is how many? Zero. We have not reached the end of the world. The angels have not gathered the wicked, the tares, and cast them into this place. We're going to talk about it as we go. Second Peter 2 9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust until the day of judgment to be punished. You know, God is, is holding this back. The judgment is not going to happen. And so the, the executive. Uh, form of the judgment where this is carried out he says he's, he's reserving this to the end of the world that's when the, the wicked will be punished it says remember last Saturday night we saw that when a man dies we don't immediately go to our reward Jesus says when he comes he'll bring his reward with him and we talked about last night the four groups of people and what happens with them and we saw that right now all our dead loved ones those who have passed away are merely in the grave asleep there's no consciousness to them whatsoever. They're awaiting one of the two resurrections. So think for a minute. Would a just God send a person who to hell and then centuries later then have the judgment take place to decide, you know, oh, wait, wait, maybe we messed up there. It doesn't make sense that judgment would take, that, that punishment or reward would take place before the judgment. And you wonder, well, where do we get this idea of this forever torturing, burning hell fire? Well, it came from Satan. Just like so many of these things that, that, that misalign the character of God. And it's been passed along into Christianity from paganism. In the Garden of Eve, you remember this. We looked at this text on another night. Satan's told Eve, in contradiction to God's word, he said, Ye shall not surely die. And that lie has been passed down ever since that time. Because listen to this. If a man doesn't die, then he is what? Immortal means he is not subject to death. That means he lives on and on and on. Therefore, those who believe what Satan has said here, that if a wicked man then is immortal, then he never dies. He would burn forever and ever and ever. So if that is true, if you don't surely die, that would be true. But that's not what the Bible says. Uh, God said the wages of sin is death, not continual torture throughout all eternity. Listen to what Job said, Job 21, verse 29. He says, Do ye not know that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction? They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. This is talking about that second resurrection we looked at last night. The Bible teaches that unrepentant sinners will indeed be punished, but God certainly does not enjoy this. In fact, uh, some people say, and we read from that text that uh, quote earlier, in fact, Isaiah chapter 28 verse 21 says this, says, for the Lord shall rise and bring to pass his strange act. And we're going to see what that is at the end of the message tonight. When God brings this strange act, this thing that's contrary to who he seems to be. Listen to this. John 3.16, if you want to go there. Go to John 3.16. You, you probably already know the text. But I want you to, to listen to this text that is the most memorized, the most well-known Bible text probably among every Christian across this world. John 3.16, almost everybody knows this text. Do you want to say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but... Did you notice from that text that most everybody here tonight knew it gave two options? It says you'll perish or have everlasting life. It doesn't say you'll, you'll have everlasting life in hell or everlasting life in heaven. So there's two choices. It's either perish or have everlasting life. The love and justice of God could never be vindicated if he allowed sinful man to burn forever. There's no way. That is unspeakably cruel and diabolical, if you think about it. You know, even in man's, our faulty way of viewing things, we would never sentence even the vilest criminal to such a fate. And yet many Christians unknowingly were accusing God of the same thing. 
in July of uh, 1976, a guy named Gary Gilmore. I don't know if you remember. He walked into a gas station, and he shot the attendant. It was a young student at Brigham Young University. The next evening, this guy, Gilmore, he robbed a, a young store clerk again, and then he asked his victim to kneel, and, the, and he shot this kid in the back of the head. And most Americans, when they heard about this and read about this, they thought this man, he was one who was deserving of dying for his crimes. And, but when the, Utah, the state of Utah sentenced him to death by firing squad, the whole nation went into this controversy of whether this should take place or whether it shouldn't. And because of a Supreme Court ruling, no one had been executed at the United States at that place for almost 10 years at that point. Gilmore said he wanted to die. In fact, I looked at online and was looking at some newspaper articles about this yesterday, and he said he wanted to die. He said, go ahead, kill me. He wanted it. But, but the lawyers kept trying desperately to find a way to keep him from st to, uh, to stay for his execution. There was groups of protesters that called this inhumane, called it a pagan, paganistic ritual, they said. And the debate raged on and on about what was the most humane way of executing condemned criminals. But in all the discussion about what would take place, in all the passionate discussion that took place, no one ever considered we ought to torture him from now on, and now on, and now on, and never let him die. It was never considered. But many sincere Christians, we assume that our Heavenly Father would do that thing, that very thing. The real punishment that sinners suffer is going to be the loss of eternal life. It's to realize, like we talked about last night, when they're outside that city and they're looking in, they realize they've lost it all. They've lost it all. Everything. Just for a few short years on this earth, they've given up all eternity. And Jesus said those tares, the wicked, will be gathered and burned at the end of the world. You say, well, isn't he speaking about a burning hell? Yes, he is. Look at Matthew 25, verse 41. <clears throat> it's an interesting thing that God says that the hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Notice this, Matthew 25, verse 41. He said, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's what hell was prepared for. It's for the wicked. It's for the lost. The place that Jesus has prepared for us is heaven. That's where he's gone now to prepare a place for us. Hell is for the wicked uh, angels and for the devil himself. But if man rejects God and his salvation and we choose to follow Satan, you know, we will also share the fate of Satan and these wicked angels. You say, well, everlasting fire sounds like it goes on for quite a long time. Read verse 46 of the same chapter. Matthew 25, 46 says, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. I want you to notice something about this text. It says that the punishment that's everlasting, it's not the punishing that's everlasting. The effects of the punishment last forever. There's, it's irreversible. It's never changed. But the punishing does not go on and on and on and on and on. We'll look at some other verses that will shed some light. Hebrews 9, 12 says that Jesus uh, obtained eternal redemption for us. And so, and so also in Hebrews 6, 2, it speaks of eternal judgment. Now, we know that Christ's death took place at a specific, one specific time at one specific place, right? Yet it's eternal redemption. The effects of his redemption are forever if we accept it. That's the point. It, the, the, it's, he's not still dying on the cross somewhere. The redemption's not till, t still taking place in that sense. And, you know, we know the final judgment says eternal judgment. The final judgment takes place at one specific time. It doesn't go on forever and ever, yet it's referred to as eternal judgment. You get the point? Several places in the Bible, it does use the word forever. And I want to look at those in connection with the punishment of the unsaved. But you need to understand this. The term forever in the scriptures can re be referring to a, a finite or a definite period of time. For instance, Revelation 14 verse 11 says this. The smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. We read that and you think, okay, it means they're burning forever and ever and ever. No, it says the smoke goes on forever. You know, I want to show you some examples from the Scripture to help you get a sense of what this word, how the word forever is used in the Bible. We, we have a, the, 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 the definition in our mind of what it means, but let's see what it says in the Bible. Exodus chapter 21, verse 5 and 6. If you'd like to go there, page 82 
<clears throat> we'll look at a couple of examples. Exodus 21, verse 5. And it's referring to if a person, an Israelite back in those days, had a servant, had a slave, and this slave, you know, they, they only served him for so many years, and they were let free if they were Israelites, and then they were allowed to go free. If this person said, you know, I like living here, I, I, you know, you treat me right, my family's taken care of, I want to stay with you, this is what they would do. <clears throat> Exodus 21, verse 5 said, If the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door and to the doorpost, and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And what does it say? He shall serve him how long? Forever. forever. Now, is that servant going to serve that master forever? How long is he going to serve him? Till he dies. So the term forever is used with a, a finite uh, uh, definition here. The servant is to serve him forever as long as the servant lives or the master lives. Sometimes the word forever is referring to a, a limited time period. Jonah, we know that what the Bible says about him. It says he's in the belly of the whale forever, but he was only there three days. Look at Jonah chapter 2 verse 6. <clears throat> Jonah says, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me for how long? Forever. Jonah said, I was, I was in the belly of that well forever. But we know Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 says this. Jonah was in the belly of the well three days, three nights. It might have seemed like forever, but it wasn't forever. The term is defined, uh, is limited by, by the noun that it's describing. Look at Hannah. One more example, or maybe another or two. Hannah, the mother of Samuel, she promised, you know, she, she didn't have a child, and she, she was uh, barren, and she prayed, and, and, uh, she, and, and the, the prophet said, okay, Samuel said, I will, you're going to have a child. And she said, well, if I have a child, he's going to serve the Lord forever. She took him to the temple when he was a kid, and she, and she left him there. Says he's going to serve him forever. But Samuel only served him how long? Till he died. So the point is, again, it's this limited time frame that we're talking about here. The word forever in the Bible is simply means until the end of the age. It doesn't necessarily mean some unending period of time. Now, if it is describing something unending, it could mean that. But the word Forever in the Hebrew and the Greek mindset was simply an adjective that was limited by the, by the noun or the word that it was describing. So if someone is serving someone forever, they didn't serve them. They just served them until the person died. Romans 6, 23, reminds you again, says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life. It's death or life. Not life in heaven or life in hell. Death or life. There is going to be a fine, uh, the effects will be final, they will be everlasting. The state of being dead will never end. The punishment is eternal in its results. That's the point. Jude, verse 7. There's only one chapter in Jude, so it's just verse 7. It says at page 12, 17. Talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, they were burned up. It says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, notice what it says, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah are an example of eternal fire. This is what eternal fire looks like. The point is very clearly that they were burned up. They're not burning now, right? Sodom, the location of Sodom and Gomorrah, as far as we know, is, is the bottom of the Red Sea now. They're certainly not burning now. And so, but they're an example of eternal fire. Peter said that the destruction of those cities was an example of what was in store for those in the last days. Those who live ungodly lives, they will be burned up. 2 Peter 2.6. It says, in turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those afterward who would live ungodly. So said, this is what's going to happen to the wicked in the end. If you live an ungodly life, you don't come to Jesus. In the end, you will suffer the consequences of your own choices. That's the point. You might say, well, I know the Bible talks about this unquenchable fire. I've read that expression. I want to look at that tonight. Mark chapter 9, verse 43, page 947. Mark 943. 
It says, if your hand offends you, cut it off. It's better for thee to enter life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched. All right, there you say, gotcha. There it is, the fire that can't be quenched. So Jesus is given a picture of the fires of hell or the fires that are going to burn up the wicked as being unquenchable. The same terminology is used in the Old Testament. Look here in Jeremiah 17, verse 27. God said, if you will not hearken, this is something that God was saying to the Israelites. He said, if you will not hearken unto me to hallow the Sabbath day, notice that. He said, if you won't keep the Sabbath day, he says, then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be what? Quenched. An unquenchable fire, right? The fires kindled by the Babylonians when they destroyed Jerusalem were unquenchable. They were completely unquenchable. But they're not still burning. That doesn't mean they, don't, they never go out. The fires of Jerusalem, it, it burned up the city, and then they went out. But nobody could put them out. You know, a few years ago, um, I was, um, bought a piece of land. It was my first uh, piece of property to, to, to buy, and I was clearing it. It was, just, it was just woods. It was nothing but woods. There was no road. There was no driveway. There was no anything there. And so I, I set out after work when I get off to work in the evenings, and I took an axe and, you know, rakes and things, and I, I began to cut down the trees. I didn't have a chainsaw, so I cut the trees down. I cut them up. I piled them over on this huge ditch. There was a big drop-off. There was a hill into a sand pit at the bottom one part of my property, and it dropped down about 10, 15 foot down into a bunch of sand, and up here was all the woods and all that where, where I was clearing off the property. I would drag the stuff off. I would throw it over to the edge, throw it over into this pile. Had this huge pile. I mean, it seemed like half as big or as big as, as the set of these pews. It was a huge pile of, of trees. It had been drying for months now. It was in the summer. And so had this huge, massive pile of dried wood that was going on there. And one night, I had some friends over. And uh, I had the wise idea, we're going to burn this thing tonight. You know how guys and fires and when you're... 21 years old, you hadn't hardly got a brain, no offense to 21-year-olds, but 21-year-old guys. Uh, and so I decided I'm going to burn this thing, and I decided it's going to need a little help, so I took some gasoline, and I doused all over this big pile of wood, all over it. And I stood back, I had enough sense to know, I stood back a little bit, and I thumped a match, and when I did, it was like an explosion. It went, whoom! And there was a pine tree, probably the diameter, yay big, on the edge of that hill. And it went up way up in the air, probably as high as where those lights are. And those fires shot up, caught that pine tree on fire, and it stood like a torch burning in my front yard. I had my friend who was there with me. We had, were under the influence. And we began to, the, hose, the, the water hose wouldn't stretch all the way over to the hill. So we had to stretch as far as we could. We had five-gallon buckets. We're filling up and we'd run. And we're doing our best to put that fire out. And guess what? We couldn't get it out whatsoever. And I wasn't about to call the fire department. <clears throat> but guess what? When it burned the wood down, it burned itself out. But while it was burning, it was totally unquenchable. I could not put that fire out. But once it burned up all the wood, once it burned up all its fuel, it went out itself. That's what we're talking about here. Notice this. Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. The wicked are going to be burned up, folks. It says, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. The fire will be totally unquenchable. No man will be able to put this fire that God sends out. The wicked will cease to be. The effects of the fire will be everlasting. The effects will be everlasting, not the punishing everlasting. There'll be nothing left of the wicked. They'll be left as ashes under our feet. Look in Malachi 4, verse 3. It says, You shall tread down the wicked. For they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. You might be thinking, you don't believe in hell, do you? Yes, I do. I believe in hell. I'll say, like I said, I believe in a hotter hell than most preachers believe in today. And, and this is what I mean. The hell that I believe in, is a, it, it, the fire that I believe in, is, is a fire that God's going to send. It's going to get the job done. 
It's going to destroy. It's going to consume. It's going to uh, wipe up every bit of wickedness and sin and all of that. It's going to burn them up. It's not going to leave them toasting and burning and tortured throughout all eternity. Some say, well, this is just man's body that will be destroyed. His soul is going to live forever. We talked about this Saturday night. Look at Ezekiel 18, verse 4. It says, the soul that sinneth, it shall what? Matthew 10, 28. Jesus said, fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. In other words, complete annihilation. Doesn't it make sense? Christ came to be our substitute, for our, to, to, to die for our sins, to take our punishment. So if the penalty for sin is everlasting torment, Jesus didn't pay the price. Right? If there are sinners, if sinners are going to be burned forever and ever and ever, Jesus didn't pay the price. Romans 6, 23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Again, those two options, life or death. This was man's punishment, death. That's all. There's no eternal life in heaven or eternal life in hell. When Jesus comes at that point, he's going to give the saved immortality, but not until that point. You know, um, we ought to be thankful. I was thankful when I learned about this because I always had this confusion. Even though, You know, I, like I said, I was baptized when I was young because I was scared of hell. And it, it brought some, some, some peace to my mind to know, wait, the Bible really doesn't teach this whole thing about God's going to torture someone forever and ever. Want some more Bible? I'm going to give you some text. Psalm 37, 20. David wrote this. He said, The wicked shall perish into smoke, they shall consume away. Obadiah 16. He says, They shall be as though they had not been. Uh, the wicked will die, it says, Romans 6, 23. The wicked will perish, Luke 13, 3. The wicked will be burned up, Malachi 4, 1. The wicked will be utterly consumed, Psalm 37, 20. The wicked will be turned into ashes. Uh, the wicked will be as though they had not been. And it goes on to say, they're consumed, Psalm 21, 9. Evildoers will be cut off, Psalm 37, 9. The wicked will not be, Psalm 37, 10. They shall be cut off, Psalm 37. The wicked shall be slain, Psalm 62. The wicked will be destroyed, Psalm 145. The wicked are reserved to the day of judgment, Job 21. The wicked shall be stubble, Malachi 4.1. It shall leave them neither root nor branch, Malachi 4.1. And I've got more text, brothers and sisters. The Bible teaches that God does away with sin. He makes the universe clean again. U.S. News and World Report uh, quoted this theologian. His name was Hughes. And he, he said this. He said, hell... He, he argued that this, this, the tr traditional belief in unending punishment is linked to this erroneous belief in the innate immortality of the soul. He said, a belief, he said, that is more, based more on Plato than on the Bible. The immortality of which the Christian is assured is not inherent in himself or in his soul, but is bestowed by God, says Hughes. I don't know if you've heard of, uh, there's a movie that came out in the last few years called Hell and Mr. Fudge. Y'all heard of that one? Anybody saw it? Rent it if you can find it and watch it. But here's a description of this, this, uh, from the website about this movie. It says this, An eccentric stranger wants to hire Edward Fudge for a bizarre project. He wants Fudge to invi investigate hell. And this is a real guy, by the way, Edward Fudge is. Um, Edward Fudge is a small-town Bible Belt preacher, the son of a respected church leader known for his conservative religious views. Edward is confident that whatever the Bible really teaches is right. Trained in biblical languages and theology, he finds the project intriguing. He agrees to take it on, not knowing where it will lead. He dedicates a year of his life to a systematic study of hell in, in which his life will never be the same. His own congregation, it says, the people he loves and serves, they fire him. The publishing company he's worked for since childhood terminates his employment because he refuses to recant his positions. Ultimately, it says, Fudge emerges as a defender of faith and scripture and a champion for God's love. It says, the book that resulted from his research, The Fire That Consumes, is a compelling study on the subject of hell and eternal torment. It stands as a testimony to a man who had the courage 
to search for truth and to pay the price for what he found. The book is called The Fire That Consumes. I encourage you to buy it. It's a thick one. It's a big old book. Tons of good stuff in there. And notice he quotes, this is a quote, some quotes from the book. He says, not one time in all of Scripture does God say that any human being will be made immortal for the purpose of suffering conscience everlasting punishment. He says this, we were raised on the traditionalist view. We accepted it because it was said to rest in the Bible or on the Bible. The closer investigation of the Scriptures indicates that we were mistaken in that assumption. A careful look discovers that both the Old and New Testaments teach instead a resurrection of the wicked for the purpose of divine judgment, the fearful anticipation of a consuming fire, irrevocable expulsion from God's presence, and finally, total everlasting extinction of the wicked with no hope of resurrection, restoration, or recovery. Now we stand on that, on the authority of the Word of God. He is not the only evangelical Christian that's coming to these conclusions now. Um, I found this from Ministry Magazine today online, an article. It said, in conservative Christian circles, excuse me, in conservative circles, there's a seeming reluctance to espouse publicly a doctrine of hell. And where it's hell, there's a seeming tendency towards a doctrine of hell as annihilation. Conditional immortality appears to be gaining acceptance in evangelical orthodox circles. That conditional immortality is talking about you, you have immortality based on the condition of Jesus given that to you. We're not born with innate immortality. He said he understands the wicked to be annihilated. article said this, <clears throat> These scholars who support the Bible and reject the more liberal interpretations of Scripture have stated that they do not believe the more traditional views about hell. Most of them confess a belief in a punishment for the wicked that ends in annihilation. In other words, utter, complete destruction. One more quote from this article. There is increasing evidence that many evangelical Christians involving a variety of denominations are moving toward conditionalism. So lots of churches... Lots of people. Uh, John Stott, you might have heard of him. He believed in annihilation, conditional mortality. Others. So where do we get this idea of this eternal, burning, torturing hell? Where do we get it? Paganism, of course. Like all the other things. Like Sunday worship. Sprinkling of infants. Immortality of the soul. This never-ending, never-burning hellfire. This is where all these things come from. So the one extreme that we have is that God tortures people forever and ever and ever who reject his offer of salvation. And the other, uh, the other extreme, I guess, would be that uh, some people can't understand how a God of love could permit anyone to be destroyed regardless of how wicked they are. And so there's these two extremes, but, but God is in the business of saving people, not, not destroying people. Ezekiel 18.32, it says this, For I take no pleasure in the death of anyone declares the Lord. It's going to bring God no joy to see even the wicked die. I mean, some of you here tonight, I, I, I would just guess, have some children who've strayed from the faith or strayed from your home and the values you have in your home and they're living a rebellious life, but you, you, don't, you don't want any harm to come to them, right? God has no choice in the matter but to destroy wickedness and destroy sin and sinners if he wants to completely eradicate those things from the universe. For the, for the universe, for the world, for uh, all created beings to be safe from sin, God has to mercifully destroy, eradicate all sin and sinners after everyone has made this choice. Isaiah 55 verse 7 it says, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. Man has a choice. God will honor that choice. Heaven would be a miserable place for those who have chosen a lifestyle contrary to God's word. Think about it for a moment. In heaven, there's not going to be casinos or bars or, or heroin or liquor or, you know, none of those things that, that, that are appealing to those who are lost are going to be there, and it's, right? So it, heaven wouldn't be a joy to those who find all their joy and all their pleasure and put all their desires in those sort of things. I think heaven would make, might seem like hell to those people. 
And by the way, if, 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 if people have refused to accept God's salvation and, and God allows it to continue on, eventually the virus of sin would be spread again like it has now. You know, God has allowed Satan to continue his plan like we've talked about for some 6,000 years approximately now. It's been going and we see the results of that. We don't want to see that again. So when will this take place? We need to look at what happens at the end of the millennium again. We looked at this last night. And get the DVD if you missed it. The Bible tells us that the unrighteous, or excuse me, the righteous will be dwelling with Christ during the millennial period, as we saw. At the end of that, it says the wicked will be raised. And we saw there are two resurrections. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and come forth, they that have done good, unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. It's the two resurrections. The resurrection of life, the resurrection of damnation. The wicked will be raised up in the second resurrection. As we saw last night, Revelation 20 verse 5 says, The rest of the dead did not live again till the thousand years were finished. So when this resurrection of the dead occurs, Satan is loosed out of his prison because now uh, he has these, these people to, to uh, tempt and whatever. So he's got all these people now, and we saw how he would gather them together. They would surround the city. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2 said this And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for a husband. And so we have the city of God with all God's people descending to the earth. Satan is, is loose from his prison because all the wicked dead are raised at the second resurrection. So every person that's ever lived is alive. And you see this contrast is this heavenly city, this glorious golden city comes descending down. All those inside of it have been given immortality. They've been given these new incorruptible bodies. All the effects of sin has been wiped away. And when those who come from the graves, they're still... I guess bear the marks of why they died before because why would God give them new bodies at this point? And what a sense of loss would have to sweep over all of those people as they come from the grave and they see what they have lost. They see what could have been theirs. The devil has robbed them of the dearest possession that he could possibly have taken from them and that is eternal life. And so now they're standing before God on the charges of treason against his government and their destiny has been fixed by their choices that they have made. And so God's wisdom, his justice, his goodness are now fully vindicated before everyone. Everyone acknowledges, says every knee shall bow. But the wicked don't repent. The Bible says that Satan has gathered them together. They only regret the results of sin, the sentence of death, of, of loss of eternal life. And the Bible says in this last desperate attempt to overthrow the city of God that Satan marshals all the millions of wicked into this one big, nasty, horrible army. And Revelation 20 verse 9 says this, They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. So they all surround the city. Satan says, We're going to take the city. God's not going to give it to us, but we, we way, we far outnumber them. We'll take the city. And notice what it says. And fire come down from God out of heaven and devoured them. You want to know what devour looks like? Take me to a Mexican restaurant. You'll see. <laughs> Peter described it like this. 2 Peter 3.10 he said, the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. God takes and he burns up all the sin, the wickedness. Just like that big old pile of wood that I had burned up and it was destroyed. God's going to consume all the wickedness, all the sinful evidence off of this planet. And then he's going to recreate it again. The devil, you think, well, what about the devil? Revelation 20, verse 10, it continued on. It says, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And we'll talk about that false prophet. I had a question about that. We're going to cover that on uh, next Saturday morning, I think it is. Look at Ezekiel 28, verse 18 and 19. Satan himself will be destroyed. 
Speaking of Lucifer, thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore I will bring forth the fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee. I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And all, thee, all they that know thee among the people shall be astonished at thee. They shall, thou shalt be a terror, and never shalt thou be any more. Satan is completely destroyed forever. Never will we deal with Satan and the effects of sin again. It goes on in verse 14. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so God mercifully destroys all the wicked, including Satan and all the wicked angels. Now I want you to notice with me the terminology where it says second death there. This, this term is only used four times in the Bible. What is this second death? I want to look at all four texts briefly. Revelation 2, verse 11. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. Okay? Revelation 20, verse 14 says this. Death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power. Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the fire which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The second death is the death from which there is no resurrection. When God destroys the wicked with hell fire, on that day we just read about in Revelation 20, verse 9, at the end of the thousand years, when God wipes out all the wicked at that point, there will never be another resurrection. So it's called the second death because there will be plenty. All of those people who die the second death will have died the first death. Either before Jesus came, they were already asleep in the graves, or when Jesus came, he destroyed them. We read about last night. So they've already t had one death. This is the second death. Christians don't have the second death. We never experience the second death. The first death is the death that will be experienced if Jesus uh, doesn't come for us. This is the natural death. That's the first death. The second death is this eternal death, one from which there is no resurrection. It's those who have rebelled against God will experience the second death. Hell is not some hot spot in the center of the earth. It's the final destruction of the wicked at the very end of time. And as the flames envelop the lost, as the flames begin to burn them up, I'm sure that God, his heart is going to break. He's done everything he can to save us. He gave his son on Calvary to save every people. When he sees the vast majority of people we get the idea will be lost in the end. Jesus said straight is the gate. And narrow, narrow is the way, right? Friends, that's going to be earth's very saddest day ever. It's going to be sad for, for God. It's going to be sad for the saved. It's going to be sad for the lost. And this goes completely against the nature of God's love, but it vindicates finally his justice. It will be this very strange thing for God, who read before, said, for the Lord shall rise and bring to pass his strange act. This is the strange act of God, when out of his justice and his mercy, he has to eliminate sin and sinners. Amen, thank you. You know, when God sends that fire down to destroy all the wicked, you know, finally God will be justified. Finally God will be justified. Satan is proven to be what he is, a liar and the murderer and a destroyer. And the best of all, here's a promise I hadn't shared with you. Nahum 1.9, it says, Affliction shall not rise up a second time. We'll never deal with sin, suffering, pain, all those things ever again. Never again will planet Earth be contaminated by sin. 2 Peter 3.13 says this, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's what we're looking forward to, that place where there'll be no more sin, no more sickness, no more death. And Jesus wants to share that eternity with you and I. He wants you and I to be in that heavenly city of the redeemed. He wants to share the pleasures of, of, of life eternal and perfect health and, and, and perfect food and, and everything, perfect thoughts throughout all eternity. He paid the price for redemption at Calvary. He invites us to accept that. And we only have two choices. We choose life or we choose death. 
Nothing else. If you'd like to choose a life with me tonight, please stand up with me as we sing. Excuse me, as we pray. You don't want me to sing. <laughs> Father, tonight, as we stand here, we're saying we want to stand for Jesus. We want to stand for his word. We want to stand for life. We want to be in that city. We want to accept the, the eternal life that Jesus offers us. And we can only get it through him and, and through his righteousness. And so please, uh, send us your mercy, your peace, your presence, your healing, uh, your uh, righteousness in place of our filthy rags. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen.